Hello everyone. Hope you're having a lovely day so far. My name is Juliana in English and Juliana in Español and welcome to the Going Global podcast. Pamela Cunningham Chacon is an Afro-feminist activist and an expert on diversity and inclusion issues at the organizational level. She's a human resources professional and an internationalist with a specialty in public policies for equality in Latin America and project management with a gender approach. She is co-founder and director of the Costa Rica Afro Collective, a diverse and inclusive organization focused on the fight against racism, machismo, and sexism through political advocacy, research, and education. We're so honored to be speaking with you, Pam, and um, we thought we'd get started, and if you could please tell us about which organizations are you a part of and a little bit about them and what they do. So thank you very much for inviting me. First of all, it's always a pleasure participating in, in um, conversations like this. So I am um, part of Costa Rica Afro, which is a collective of Afro-feminist women in Costa Rica. We are focused, as you were saying, in um, providing visibility of work that Afro-Costa Rican uh, communities have done in the country for years, right? It really started as um, an effort to kind of see ourselves, right? Um, we, we, and when I say we, I mean uh, the Afro community and the specific Afro-Costa Rican women, we don't see ourselves in many places in Costa Rica, not in history, not in books, not in TV. Um, And whenever we saw uh, ourselves, it was maybe in a not such a good light, right? Or we would only see black faces and black bodies um, in in either movies or like imported from other countries or, or with negative or oppressive connotations. So we really wanted, we started this um, as a way to support Um, our community and to bring that visibility. So that's activism perspective. That's where I collaborate from in, in my political position, right? I also collaborate in, in a group that we, we called uh, Black Lives Matter Costa Rica, which is uh, integrated by basically three other organizations, which is uh, Centro de Mujeres Afrocostarricenses, which is another Afrofeminist group, Lectiva Transparencias, which is a collective for Uh, by trans women, and for and by trans women, and um, we basically ended up, you know, we're friends, and we we ended up uh, working in different areas. And when the whole, specifically George Floyd, Breonna Taylor things happened this year, and well, this year, which has been, you know, this year, we decided to take action, and we started working on kind of uh, bringing more visibility to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, specifically the needs in Costa Rica. I also participate in other groups, feminist groups and, and other um, different activism, but those are my main two. Thank you so much for that, for the information. And I just wanted to say that it makes me so happy that there are groups like those in Costa Rica just advocating for visibility and, and for human rights that are needed. So I'm just so grateful that the groups exist. And um, I just wanted to ask you about how your route to activism and being part of these groups began. And then more specifically about um, your journey in feminism and then about um, your journey as an intersectional activist. Yeah, so It really started selfishly, I'm going to be honest with you, um, because I'm biracial. My mom uh, is um, Caucasian and my dad was Afro, right? So I was um, I was raised in, in uh, with a level of privilege where I didn't question my belonging in a group and, and I really never questioned my differences, let's say. Now, looking back, I, I can see where they were, but at that point, I thought, you know, I don't see color and we're all the same and that kind of thing, right? But as I grew, I, you know, was confronted with those things and I started learning about the inequalities around me, right? And um, I started searching for for me, for answers for me, right? My main question, and, and I always share this, I really wanted to know if I, if I was black, if I could really call myself a black woman, because, you know, I, I'm, was I? Because my mom was white, I was not, I didn't have all those 
markers that make uh, supposedly make a black person black right and and so i started studying and learning and understanding and um i really was you know the stars really aligned and got me to meet um Mr. Donald Allen, he's a sociologist and he worked in an organization called Proyecto Caribe and he really guided me into learning a lot about the whole African experience and Pan-Africanist, I think is the word, Pan-African, I don't know, uh, experience and so forth, right? So I learned a lot there, but then as a woman, it came a moment where I, I started asking myself. So I answered the question. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm black. Okay, I'm fine with that. And then I asked, I started asking myself, but there's a lot of things about me being a woman that are not being talked about in, in the circles of, of, of Afro-activism, right? So I went the other way and I started working a lot in feminist circles, right? I, I'm a firm believer in the right to choose, sexual and reproductive rights, and 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 I'm re I went really I went really deep into the feminist uh, work. But then again, I was met with feminism, at least as I experienced it, which now I understand was white feminism. Uh, really, is not talking about the others, right? What about the the women in rural areas? What about um, Afro women, about uh, indigenous women, about Asian women? What about women of color? What about the gender diversities? Why aren't we talking about all this? And then, of course, I was not Kimberly Crenshaw and I didn't invent intersectionality. So I looked it up and I figured, well, it exists. This people, Other people have had the same questions as I did. And that's when I figured out that all those experiences that I was having or that, you know, I was uh, experiencing were not unique to me. They were, um, a lot of people had had the same questions and they, well, they, they're much more intelligent than me and created theory about it, right? So I started reading that. And that's when, you know, the intersectionality of feminism, of Afro-activism, the most important part of my activism. I really cannot separate intersectionality from my activism because I am intersectionality, right? And my friends are intersectionality. I cannot, my, my daughter, my mom, so we, we are, we contain multitudes. So how can we not work, our political work cannot con those multitudes, right? And that's how I, in my mind, at least, and in my work, I'm, I marry those two concepts, and and they're integral to to my activism. It is so true. It is just so important to be an intersectional feminist. Keep everybody included, because then what's the point of just being an activist for just a certain group of people? So thank you so much for bringing that perspective. And um, in that same topic, I wanted to ask you about how can I guess everyday people who are not familiar perhaps with the intricacies of intersectionality, how can they be not only, if they call themselves feminists, how can they be feminists, but at the same time be intersectional feminists? Yeah, so for me, it's it's kind of simple in my mind. So I'm simplifying it, but okay. um, it's not all about you. Yes. <laughs> that's that's how I summarize it, right? It is not about what you want because in most cases you are an exception. You're not the rule, right? The fact that you are able to read about feminism, to understand that, to to even sit down and analyze it gives you a level of privilege that most people don't have, right? Yes. So it's starting whatever activism or part of any um, group that you have uh, or that you're going to be part of, thinking that what your experience is, is is the center is the wrong perspective. I think that we really need to understand that we are not the center, right? And, I, you know, I, I'm going to get political. So, <laughs> for example, um, the fact that uh, right now in the elections, the U.S. elections, 55 percent of women, of white women, voted for Donald Trump, even though his policies are against them. Right. right. Um, I'm, I'm sure that 
in that 55%, I'm sure there's a bunch of them that call themselves feminists. But how are you for female liberation if it only involves white women or women in certain places or women with certain privilege, right? So when you make it about yourself, then you make decisions that harm others. And I need that people need to ask themselves am I, what am i what i'm doing is it harming somebody is it erasing somebody's experience is it making me the center and usually making yourself the center is not the right way right and if you think that way then you fully understand why intersectionality is important and it's super complex so it's not an easy answer <laughs> but but you would understand why it's important i completely agree and understand yes it just it, it is so important to keep in mind because at the end of the day what you said is true it's if you're an activist, you're doing it not because you're the center of the world, but because of um, what it means, you know, collectively. So thank you so much for that perspective. And um, in this conversation about gender and, and feminism, I wanted to ask you about why would somebody that calls themselves a supporter of equality among all genders not call themselves a feminist? Like, why do you think some people feel apprehensive to label themselves that way? Well, you know, if you had asked that um, at the beginning of the year, I would have said something different. But okay. I think that feminism has been has been used has is a word that has been used or portrayed negatively, right, for a very long time. So a lot of people think that feminism is being burning bras and being angry and hating men, and yes, but not <laughs> all of it, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that some people don't want to say they're feminists because they don't want to be seen in a negative light, right? That's one part of the people. And I understand it, but I think that can be solved with education, right? At the end of the day, if you if you tell somebody feminism is about equality, are you against equality? Most people would say no, they're not against equality. But there's a bigger question there. And I've, I've started to question the use of feminist as a label, right? First of all, sometimes, you know, when I will wake up the more really belligerent, I ask myself, why do we need to label each other, right? But um, I've started to question if for a while this year, I started to question, should I call myself a feminist? Because feminism really doesn't represent me, right? Because I felt excluded from mainstream feminism or, or white feminism. I think also that white feminists and TERFs I have taken and SWERFs have taken uh, a hold of feminism and have brought a level of, or, or the other way around, have taken away the intersectionality that for me is embedded in feminism. So this is a long way of answering your question, but I think that either way, we need to educate ourselves and others about what feminism is. For me, and I think I'm right, feminism is intersectional by nature. It is inclusive of trans women, of sex workers, of white Black, Afro, uh, Indigenous, uh, I apologize, Black, Indigenous, and pe and women of color, right, uh, of the LGBTI community, it's, it's an inclusive movement, right? So anybody that comes in trying to say that it, it's inclusive except for X, Y, or C, or it's inclusive, but it should be about this first, then it's generating noise around feminism. I really like to take it to the simplest of terms or definitions and say it is an intersectional movement of inclusiveness and equality. That is what feminism is. So if you want to call yourself feminist, you need to have that. If you exclude anybody, then you're not a feminist. And I think it is our job as feminists to actually kick those people out of feminism and confront them and tell them you are not a feminist actually don't call yourself that because that's not what feminism is about um and then more people will feel, would feel comfortable saying they are feminists right no i agree and that just all you said makes total sense because movement in itself 
if it calls for equality, it has to be intersectional because you can't exclude people mm -hmm. and be equal at the same time. That is impossible. So I am in agreement with you. I face the same struggle sometimes with the label because of what you said, but I agree at the end of the day, feminism by nature, it's intersectional. And what you said about mainstream feminism is true that sometimes it tends to be taken over by just white feminism and there's not a space for everybody else to be heard. So I was wondering, what do you think it has to happen for mainstream feminism to become intersectional feminism in a, in a place where everybody can be heard equally and equitably. I think uh, what, what we were talking before, we need to stop being selfish. I really think that this mindset, this kind of neoliberal capitalist, and I really don't want to get, you know, too, too radical, but, <laughs> but this um, capitalist concept that you are the most important thing or person in the world and your needs are the most important have have created um a lack of solidarity and it has created you know selfishness selfishness in our movements the fact that mainstream feminists are comfortable with um you know having women being sterilized by you know in the in the border that tells me that they're not really feminists, right? Because if you're fighting for the right to choose, why are you fighting for the right to choose for white privileged women, the right to choose for an abortion, but not for immigrant black and brown women to have children, right? To be for their bodies to be respected. And you only do that when you're selfish and you don't and you don't think so I think that there's a level of personal responsibility that we need to, to take and that we need to say, am I being, you know, ask yourself, am I being intersectional in this position or how can I be more intersectional in this position? Should I give this space to somebody else? Should I take a step to the side or even a step down and uh, let others speak, right? The fact that just what, a week and a half, two weeks after the election, white women and, and, and white men too, black men, are trying to erase the work that black women did for the Democratic Party right. is, you know, is a lack of intersectionality. The fact that the Democratic Party is, is kind of blaming the progressives when they should be thankful uh, for the work they did is, is really an under, it's, it's really, it really highlights their lack of understanding. They are really in, in their mind, they're, they're really committed to continuing with a, with a line that has not provided results. And I'm using that as an example because it's very fresh in my mind, but it, it's, it's everywhere, right? When, when young people with new ideas come in, they're shut down in many areas, right? Um, and that generates problems at the end of the day because, you know, old people are going to die <laughs> and, and I'm sorry to tell them, but it's the, it's the young people that need to be running stuff because they have more time right? Uh, we don't need a 70-year-old telling us what to do. I mean, I hope you live forever, but you're going to die soon. And we have people that are, you know, in their 20s and 30s with great ideas or even younger participating, you know, trying to change the world. If what we're looking is to change the world, then we need to let them, right? And it's the brown and black people, especially women that are doing it. We need to let them. And at the end of the day, again, I'm sorry, I talk a lot. To answer your question, people need to stop being selfish. They need to stop putting themselves in the center. They need to step down. They need to step back. They need to step to the side and bring, make sure that they leave the space for the people that are doing the work and that are, um, you know, diverse. You, they need to be included. We need to be included so that that change can come. That answer was wonderful. I really appreciate you going into detail because that's really helpful and it really paints a picture like with the example that you posted, the election of how not having intersectionality can really, if you're not intersectional, you're not really realizing what's actually happening in the world and acknowledging and giving credit to um, all the people that are working hard but that might not be heard because we're self we're working on a selfish mindset. So I think that highlight that what you highlighted is really important of being compassionate and 
um, selfless and just really giving the space, which is so important. Um, and then continuing our conversation about um, feminism and gender and intersectionality, I think we've come to um, the conclusion that language is really important. For instance, the label of feminism and, and the meaning of and then speaking of gender, we know um, that many languages like Spanish like assign gender to everything and there's little room for inclusivity. So I was just wondering um, what your thoughts were if you think that current language, both English, English Spanish, mm -hmm. uh, Romance languages, Germanic languages in general, um, reinforce the patriarchy? Yes. <laughs> so the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, language is very important. And it's important to v value the language that we have and that we use um, because it is a way to communicate um, with certain people. There's, you know, people are going to understand it in a way. But I think it's important that we decolonialize language, right? Why do we want to continue using terms or phrases or ways of speaking that are just because they are? Right. Spanish especially has been very reluctant to um, change. Right. And in Spanish, the Real Academia Española, which is the academy that supervises language, has been adamant of not including uh, inclusive terms. Right. They, inc they include a, a lot of things, but not inclusive. Right. Of course, it's a bunch of white males that are making decisions, so that's that shouldn't be surprising, because they have and they're old. Not that I am ageist; I'm old too. But you know, mm -hmm. they have a certain mindset. So I think it's very important that we decolonialize it, and that even if people say, "Oh, that's not the way it's supposed to be said," well, it's the way it, it is because I'm saying it, right? So yes. um, the more we do it, the more it makes sense. It it sounds correct to people in spanish um you know we i make an effort of using either the feminine feminine and, and masculine for example los and las or to use a neutral term less right i i made a point of talking about my pronouns i use she and her and i do that as a way of initiating conversations like why are you doing that right uh why are you making a point and when people discuss that with me i said okay i will not use both i will use only feminine that if it's the same right and they get all worked up and that's when they kind of realize, even though they're not going to tell me, that it is patriarchal. If it is not a problem to use just one gender, because what they say is, oh, the male, it, you know, let's use the male because it's it's the same. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. Yes. I'm like, okay, if it's all the same, let's use the feminine then. Exactly. And they don't like it because they, their patriarchal ways of thinking wouldn't allow them to be referred to themselves in the feminine. Right. But I'm expected to be OK with being referred to in the masculine. Right. So when when you start kind of decolonizing that and start pushing the envelope, people start um, making, you know, it starts making sense. And just this week in, you know, um, in my family, we have a group chat and in the group chat, a family member said, kind of like a picture of Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. And and they said, now I understand. And it's a picture that's been circulating where there's like all the vice presidents and then it's her on the side, like standing. Um, and and my, my, my uncle said, oh, now I understand why you use los and la, right? It makes a difference, mm -hmm. right? Even if it's only one, it does make a difference. If not, she would be erased. And, well, it, it's taken too long for people to figure that out. But at least they're figuring it out, right? So with time, um, it, you will see the change, but it's something that has to come in hand or hand in hand with other changes in our society. But definitely language can bring that change or at least a change, change in mindset. I completely agree. Um, and that is such a good example that illustrates how, like, one one person doing something does make a difference and does bring that space that allows change to happen. And in um, continuing with that topic, I was wondering um, which changes do you think have to happen along with language? And then also, um, why do you think it's uh, more challenging for 
older generations to adapt to the changes and um, what can we do to make um, the transition, I guess, easier or to make it more mainstream? Well, um, I think it's difficult because you're just used to doing it one way, right? I, I always say when I was in, in school, they told me that water was a renewable uh, element and, and it would never, we would never run out of water, right? Um, but I'm sure children are not being taught that anymore, right? Or um, So we need to understand that people get certain ideas in their head, uh, especially during the, their initial education, that are going to bring through their life. That That's why for me it's so important, early education is so important. Early, diverse, and inclusive education is so important. Because when you put that in the child's mind at an early age, they, they don't question it. They, they take it at face value and they learn it, right? And it, it builds who they are. The people that are reluctant are, are really set in their ways and they just want things their way, right? Which I also understand because sometimes I'm like, why do you want to change that? It's working fine or I'm comfortable with that. And it's not a problem for me. So I'm fine with it being that, still being that way. Right. And I know it has nothing to do with it, but I'm going to give you this example. Recently, Costa Rica, they were having some fights about, well, not fights, discussions about um, the use of public transportation and the train and using an electric train and all that. And I was like, I don't care about that. I have a car. So I, I literally didn't pay attention to it. And then somebody asked me and I, I answered. I don't care. I have a car. I ride. I drive my car everywhere. And when I said it, I was like, "Damn! I wow! What what a privilege! I don't have to think about this because it doesn't concern me." So for me, bus stations and trains could have stayed the same. It didn't. It didn't make any difference to me. So I didn't get involved, and I didn't see a need for change, right? Because I had, you know, I had all my needs covered. But it's the same with language for me, right? People that don't see the need to change is because they have their needs covered. They don't care. It's okay with them. And and we go back again to the selfishness. It's okay with them so they don't care. They have the privilege of not caring. But there's others that don't have that privilege. And I think it's our duty, even if it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't affect you, just for solidarity and because we want to live in a, in a, in a world where there's more equality, um, we need to get involved and we need to have an opinion and we need to make a change. So it's important that, you know, don't fight with your grandpa, but but start talking to your little cousins <laughs> and they're going to make that change, right? Yes. Oh, I love that approach. And that is it's so true. It's so true. Um, we If we have that privilege, then even more so we should be in the part of the conversation because we have a certain voice. And um, so just to be a good, um, empathetic human being, it's, it's my point. So I completely agree with you. And I also agree in the fact that hopefully younger generations will grow up with um, a more open-minded mindset and that'll help us in the long run. But in the meanwhile, I was wondering... Um, if you believe any systemic change will occur. So for instance, um, in English, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary recently accepted the use of de they as a singular pronoun um, that can be used instead of she or he. So I was wondering if you think um, La Real Academia Española is going to be doing something similar anytime soon, or if you think that they will. Not anytime soon. I don't think so. But well, this year, if this year has taught me anything, is that you never know, right? Um, so I, I don't think anytime soon, and I'm going to tell you why. Spain is going through a very big, like conservative backlash. Not only Spain, right? Europe, every, everywhere in the in the world, but Spain is 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 having it real, real bad, right? So I think that right now. The powers that be at the Real Academia really are not invested in change. They're actually invested in not changing, right? So I don't think we're going to see anything soon. And and also, 
the Spanish is kind of very much like conservative, I think, in 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 its way of being reproduced and so forth. Uh, that I don't think it's it's going to actually be a change. There's going to be a change. If you look at the at the members of the Real Academia, there's uh, only eight women, and there's it's 46 members. It's only eight mm-hmm. women, and it, you know none of the women are what I would call radical in their progressiveness right so i don't think we it is built for change right it's been 300 years and i i don't think you know the next 10 years are going to make a huge difference but what i do think is that we might see a, a change in the need for validation from the real academia right so i've seen a lot of books, a lot of teachers, a lot of professors being inclusive, even when the Real Academia says that's not supposed to be done. People are fighting it. And I think at some point, maybe in the next 20 to 25 years, um, the world or, or the the usage of the language um, is going to be so different that the Real Academia is going to have to adapt. So what I, what I really think what needs to be done is for us to use the language in an inclusive way, because that way we're going to force that change. You know, um, I don't remember who said it, but um, I'm paraphrasing, but you cannot uh, change the master's house using the master's tools or something like that is what, what the phrase says. You, we cannot use our tools to change it. So we need, we need to, oh, it's the, the master's tools will never dismantle will never dismantle the master's house right so we we in its audrey lord so it's not we shouldn't expect them to change it it should be us right that that makes that that change in the day to day and then we'll force them to do it that does make sense because if we each individually start being more inclusive in the way that we speak in the way that we act um, if we all start doing it they're gonna have to change it because it doesn't it they have to reflect what um, what the language is being like and languages are evolving and they're not stagnant. So um, I think your analysis is so on point. I completely agree. <laughs> and um, I really appreciate you, um, Dick, like being really honest because it would be a lot easier to just be like, oh, yes, oh, it'll happen soon. But it, it's true that we need to like, <laughs> analyze and see what is currently happening because that will be even more of a, a push for us for change, right? So. So thank you for that. Um, and then just to kind of start closing off, I was wondering um, about, I wanted to ask you about Costa Rica specifically and um, about your perspective. So how do you um, see the situation in Costa Rica being exposed to so many years of activism if you have seen real change? Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> it depends the day of the week, when, <laughs> depending on how I wake up. But um, yes, we cannot... Um, we cannot deny that there has been a change and there has been a change for the better, right? It is, um, you know, there's more women in positions of leadership. We have uh, the first Afro um, vice president in the Americas was Epsi Campbell, followed by Kamala now. Um, We have um, a lot of public policy towards equality for certain groups. Others, of course, still need to get that work done. We have seen change. We have seen change in in the day to day use of the language. In the um, you know the the day to day use of the language. For example, in our Minister of uh, Issues, Bramu, Instituto Nacional de las Mujeres, she makes a point of using inclusive language. We have uh, Congress people that make a point of using inclusive language and being inclusive and and you know facilitating the creation of public policy that that is um, inclusive and diverse and towards equality. So yes, I would say yes, we have progress. Now, excuse me, we live in a moment in time that is very complex, right? There's a whole influx of conservative views around the world, far right thoughts and actions and leaders supporting that not only in the United States, but in everywhere. You know, just in Peru, there was basically a coup. Um, 
we have issues in in Poland, we have issues in Spain, we have issues, you know, everywhere. All across across the world, there's really a, a, a backlash of conservative um, thought and far right thought, and I think this is happening because, precisely because we have made strides and advanced and progressed, right? And then people that again want to be selfish and want to do what they want and what benefits them want to stop that. So I think we need to be very vigilant in the in the upcoming years to make sure that 70 million people that voted for Trump in the U.S. don't continue getting positions of, of leadership and power because they will do everything in their power to oppress, right? And in, in the United States, here in Costa Rica, we're living it as well with, uh, with the evangelical, Christian, conservative, far-right conservatives. We need to make sure they don't get to power because they are looking to oppress and to take rights away. So I think that because we have progressed, it is that we, uh, we are seeing this backlash. And because we have progressed, we need to continue progressing. We cannot stop or give up because right now it's more important than ever, right? Because if we go back, I mean, we cannot go back. I don't even want to think about it. If if we go well, if we go back, we're gonna see what we just saw for four years in the United States, right? Um, and and amplified, and and we don't want that, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's so important to keep openness and mindfulness and a progressive look at the world because it, the dangers of having oppressive people in power unthinkable. And like you said, I don't even want to think back about that because it's just it's not a world I want to live in. It's not a world we want to live in. Um, so mm -hmm. yes. So on that note, I was wondering um, what you thought would be something that everybody could do every single day to help make the world a better place to live. Wow, that's a big question. So I think, <laughs> so the first thing I would tell everybody is, yes, there's a lot of work to do and there's a lot of stuff going on. But the first thing you want to do is take care of yourself, right? And by that, I mean your mental health, make sure you're, you know, drinking your water, you're eating, you're taking your pills, because if you are not okay, you cannot help others, right? So, and I say this from a position of, I've burnt out, because sometimes all you see is bad news or things happening, and you burn out. We don't want you to burn out, because we need you. We need you here, so Self-care is very important. That's the first thing that everybody should do on a daily basis. Then the second thing is fight, literally, <laughs> right? Whenever you have the opportunity, don't put yourself in a position to get, you know, harm. Don't put yourself in harm's way. But wherever you are, you have the power to put an idea in somebody's mind that's going to change things. So if you're in a class and somebody's saying something that you fully disagree with, don't let it go. St you know, uh, raise your hand and make a point. Now, don't don't get a bad grade in that class. You don't need to, you know, sacrifice yourself at that level, but say something, right? If somebody's joke making a joke that is not funny, that's actually homophobic or transphobic or racist, Raise your hand. Don't go to all the fights you're invited to, but go to some. Because at the end of the day, it is those little fights that we make that uh, or that we fight that are going to make a change. You never know who's listening. Really, you never know who's listening. You, might, you I remember, and my, my cousin's going to kill me because of this, but mm -hmm. I remember that maybe five years ago, I, you know, I have a 16-year-old daughter, so I, and I never wanted to breastfeed because I don't. I didn't want to. My, uh, We were having a discussion, though, because women were breastfeeding. A woman was breastfeeding in a mall in Costa Rica, and she was kicked out of the mall. So there was a whole, of course, huge thing happening. And in my family, we were having uh, uh, lunch, and we were talking about that. And I was like, I, don't, I didn't breastfeed, but, you know, I would go and fight for that woman's right to breastfeed because you know, it's the right thing to do and blah, blah, blah. And I remember one of my cousins, she said, that's nasty. If she wants to breastfeed, she should go to the bathroom and blah, blah, blah. Right. But I kept talking about it and whatever. Then she had a baby and, and then she called me and she, I remember because she had the, the milk pump. She had two milk pumps, one in each breast. She was 
literally half naked and she's like pam you were right <laughs> i should be able to breastfeed and to pump wherever i right so i was like thank you it only took you like five years <laughs> but you you know um it's important to have those fights and have those conversations because then somebody will say, well, maybe it wasn't such a weird idea. May, well, it made sense or tell me more. And then that's how change happens. And now my cousin is like, every time somebody's breastfeeding, it's like, hey, pull that boob out. The mm -hmm. baby's hungry. It doesn't matter. Exactly. Right. Um, and now she defends other women's rights to breastfeed in public. So you never know. And it's important that we do it, that we talk, that we, you know, it's, we don't, we don't only learn by reading or watching movies or, or watching, um, or going to class. We learn by talking and by having these conversations and by questioning and saying, I'm not sure about this. Can we talk about it? So that is, is, is the other thing. And finally, to close, I think that the one thing we need to do is decide if we want to be, in my case, anti-racist or not. If you decide that you want to be anti-racist, that means that you're going to speak truth to power when you have to. You're going to support. Sometimes you can support with your presence. Sometimes you can support financially. Sometimes you can support with work. But you're going to have to support. Because if you're anti-racist, then you're going to be anti-racist always. You cannot pick and choose because I cannot pick and choose, right? I have to take, I have to take it every time and I have to take a stand every time because my, the color of my skin makes it that way. So if you, and when I talk to you, I'm talking to the other, right? Um, if you want to be anti-racist, if you want to collaborate, it could be anti-racism. It could be um, supporting the um, LGBTQI community. It could be whatever, whatever your position is that is progressive, right? Um, if you want to support it, then wholeheartedly support it, right? Don't say something and then go vote for Donald Trump. You know what I mean? Yes. Oh my gosh. I know exactly what you mean. And that is such an important message to highlight because it we see that a lot with like um performative activism, which is not enough. Mm -hmm. We have to be like wholeheartedly into um, the fight, which I completely agree with. So I think that's such a beautiful way uh, to end uh, this conversation and so needed. And um, I'm so glad you highlighted the importance of every single person just doing their part because it does add up. So thank you so much for all the wonderful examples and um, for all of your valuable insight and for your time. We're so thankful to have been able to talk with you today. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And you know, this is probably my first or second interview in English. And I think I sound smarter in English. <laughs> so keep inviting me. <laughs> yes, yes. And I'll be Amazing. Glad. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no, we're so honored. We're so honored. Yes, that, that was incredible. Thank you so much for listening to our Going Global podcast. If you have any ideas for any upcoming episodes, make sure to DM our Instagram at LIU Global. Thank you so much again and see you next time.